Welcome back. Uh, we're now going to turn to the next, uh, the second set of, of presentations. Uh, before we do, I wanted to acknowledge that among the, the many people here in the audience, we have a group of students from the uh, Crimson Achievement Program uh, who are here on a spring uh, break trip to Harvard and Boston, sponsored by the Harvard Club of Seattle. So welcome. Uh, and please continue to um, send in questions, either uh, for those of you here in person or from the online audience using the Slido link uh, behind me. Uh, so our first speaker of this session is Dr. Erica Nelson, assistant professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. And Dr. Nelson will tell us about Too Fast, Too Furious, galaxy formation at the beginning of cosmic time. And then our second speaker of the program is Lisa Grossman, um, science writer at Science News. And Lisa will discuss the ups and downs of JWST in the news. Okay, it's now my pleasure to invite Dr. Nelson to the podium. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, it's so great to see you, and it's so great to be here. Um, it's really nice to be back to Harvard always. Um, and I'm really grateful to be escaping the miserable sunny weather of Colorado. Um, so I am going to tell you about galaxies that are close to the edge of our obser observable universe. But before I do, um, I want to start a little bit closer to home in Boulder, Colorado. Well, this is closer to my home. Not yours, really, but um, OK. So I want to start in Boulder, Colorado. And in Boulder is actually where um, Ball Aerospace is which is where uh, engineers and scientists spent um, a long time building the primary mirror of the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, so the primary mirror of the James Webb Space Telescope is actually 18 gold-plated beryllium hexagons, um, which are then assembled into the large, beautiful golden mirror that we see. Um, so in 2013, uh, in what I imagine is the most nerve-wracking furniture move of all time. Um, you know, it's like you don't want to break your stuff, but you really don't want to break these. Um, so these were shipped across the country to the Goddard Space Flight Center um, in Greenbelt, Maryland. Um, and they were assembled into uh, what we are very familiar with now, which is the giant golden mirror of the James Webb Space, space Telescope. And so this is the world's most powerful and expensive telescope that has ever been built. Um, and construction on this actually started before at least some people in the front row uh, were born. I can, this, can, this uh, are you guys, were you born after 1996? Yep, there we go. Uh, yeah, so uh, this, um, I was a little worried that that joke was not gonna land, um, but, um, we got a couple. Uh, so this uh, construction on this started in 1996. Uh, so, and it's really been a testament to international collaboration. Components of this telescope were built and assembled and tested all over the world. And it's really remarkable that humanity came together to build this remarkable piece of scientific machinery. So after 10 billion dollars and over 20 years, uh, we eventually finished our fabulous telescope and we put it in a boat and we shipped it through the Panama Canal to French Guiana where we folded it up and put it in the top of a rocket and then we blasted it into space. Maybe we blasted in this. Yeah, here we go. This, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, unity, top. And we have engine start. And lift off. Decollage. Decollage, lift off from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. Punching Such a, a hole through line. the clouds, 
20 seconds into the flight, good pitch pro. Such a good line. Uh, I love that to the, from the or tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. So I watched that, um, I watched that with my parents on Christmas Day. I made them get up at six in the morning and drink champagne at six in the morning. I was like, I've been waiting for this my whole career. So, you know, this is what's happening, guys. Um, so, but, so it, it launched, and in most missions, the majority of the risk budget happens during launch. But that was simply not true for the James Webb Space Telescope. After that, there was more than 300 individual deployments which had to go right in order for our fancy, beautiful telescope to actually work how we were intending it to. So it's flying through space at thousands of miles an hour, and while it's doing that, it has to assemble itself. So first, it folds out the sun shield that Ido mentioned, uh, these five layers of what is effectively tin foil. Consider that. You're not wrapping your sandwich in it. It's the key to a telescope working. Um, and these things are the size of a tennis court, and you need to not mess that up. So uh, it's hurtling through space, um, folding out this, uh, its sun shield, which is essential to the cool mission that it is because the Earth and the sun both radiate in infrared. And so if you are not blocking that emission, then you are toast. Um, so the, and then it had to fold out its mirror. And that mirror has to be perfectly aligned. I know we've all apparently used the phrase human hair, but I'm going to again. Uh, it has to be aligned to within one four hundredth the width of a human hair. So everything has to go perfectly in order for this telescope to work. Um, and so, you know, we, we have all of these really high risk features, which is the reason that this thing spent so, we spent so long building and designing this thing, is every piece is revolutionary. Everything that we, every component of this is brand new. It's not tested, um, which is why it took so long. Um, and so um, it has all these fabulous instruments. And the big question that you might be asking right now, why? Why on earth did we do this? Why did we spend more than 20 years and billions of dollars to take a very fragile instrument and launch it a million miles away where we can't fix it if we messed something up, which we did with Hubble. You know, we, that was that was that was a bad that was a bad day. Um, so why did we do this? And the answer is that throughout history, launching new instruments, whether sorry, deploying new instruments to look into the sky, we have launched some, and some have been Earth-based, has expanded our cosmic perspective. It has taught us how we fit into the universe, how we fit into uh, the, the place that we live, how we came to be, why we're here, when it all started. These questions that are really at the core of the things we wonder about, that are at the core of some of our religions, these questions really drive humans. And when we are able to expand our cosmic perspective, it changes the nature of the universe as we understand it. Uh, one good example of this is this image. Anyone know what this is? Yeah. What is it? Hubble saying it's a dam. No, no, it's, what are they, are they taking the very far? Yes. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, this is a picture, a very bad picture, of our nearest galaxy, Andromeda. Um, before this, um, before it was understood that this was a different galaxy, we thought that this was simply a nebula in our own galaxy, and there was only one galaxy in the whole universe, and that is the one we lived in. With the discovery of this galaxy and then subsequent uh, discoveries, we realized that the universe is so much bigger than we ever thought. And then we discovered that it was expanding. And we realized that instead of what we thought, which was a universe that was finite in space and eternal in time, it's actually the opposite. Our universe is finite in time and 
infinite in space. So it's really these, these new ways of seeing the universe that change our understanding of who we are and our place in the universe. And, you know, really, it just tells us we're smaller and smaller and smaller and less significant every single time. Uh, but, you know, that's not something to worry about. So we launched James Webb to understand our cosmic origin story, to understand where we came from and where we're going. Um, and uh, we heard two great talks earlier trying to understand the formation of stars and planets and uh, planetary disks. And I'm concerned with this question of our cosmic origin story on the largest scales. The formation of galaxies and supermassive black holes, what happens at the outer reaches uh, of our observable universe. So, in order to understand how uh, objects form, we ideally would like to watch them forming. Astronomy is a strange science in the sense that we cannot actually take a galaxy and put it in a lab and poke it and see what it does, right? It's, it's too big, you know, it's, it's it, and, it, and it evolves over billions of years, so that's not an appropriate scale for a PhD thesis. So we, we really need to find different ways of understanding things at these large scales. And fortunately, um, one of the hardest problems to solve um, is also the thing that makes the study of astronomy, in my humble opinion, one of the coolest, which is that everything is really big. I know that's really profound. Aren't you happy? Um, but the reason that that is so helpful to us is because light takes a finite amount of time to travel. Although we think of light as traveling instantaneously from one place to another, it goes really fast, but it's not instantaneous. And so if we have a powerful instrument like a telescope, which allows us to see things that are very distant, what that means is that we are seeing them as they were in the past. And James Webb is the most powerful instrument we've ever had to do this. So what this effectively means is that a telescope is a time machine. Um, so this was actually an idea that um, I found so fascinating as a very unfortunately dressed eight-year-old, um, that, uh, that is the reason I'm standing before you today. Um, we can use telescopes to look back into the past and see how the first galaxies formed. We can use these telescopes to see back to close to the beginning of time itself. Um, one complication of this is that as our universe expands, the light that is emitted by distant objects, the wavelength is stretched. Uh, this is called redshift. Uh, and as this light is stretched, it means that light that was emitted in wavelengths that we can see with our eyes, um, if it goes through a huge distance on its way to us, it is redshifted into the near infrared um, or further. Uh, and so this is why we needed the James Webb Space Telescope. While Hubble allowed us to see um, into, into the, in the optical and ultraviolet and just into the near infrared, James Webb was really designed to see further into the infrared um, and hence to closer and closer to the beginning of cosmic time. So uh, we had a telescope that did this before. Oh man, that loaded too fast. I was gonna make you guess what this was a picture of. Um, oh well. Uh, so this is a Spitzer image of the SMAX cluster. This was the first, uh, the first image released by President Biden in the press conference in the summer of 2022. Um, and you can see as we transition between the previous best image of this and the uh, image we have now, the remarkable difference in the, the depth of this, um, of this imaging and also the, the detail. And those two things are both essential because 
objects that are close to the beginning of time are very small and they're very faint. So a lot of these little dots that you see, especially the red ones popping out in this uh, SMAX image, in this JWST image, are actually some of the first galaxies. So we were very excited when President Biden released this image. Um, we also waited for two hours, which was Really, you have more important things to do than release this image. Come on. Um, but we, uh, me and a bunch of my colleagues and friends, uh, sat around drinking champagne, waiting for this to, uh, waiting for this to, this image to be released. And as soon as it was, um, we immediately dug into the data. Um, and the first, one of the first things that I did was to compare the Hubble image that we had of this cluster to uh, the new James Webb image. And one of the things that popped out to me first was this. You can see it circled in red. It is this object that is big and it's bright and it doesn't even exist in the Hubble image. It's completely invisible. Um, and so uh, what we ended up finding is there is a ton of these. There's a ton of these really bright objects in the infrared that we don't even detect um, in, in the Hubble images. Um, a couple of these uh, I called UFOs for ultra red flattened objects, also just to mess with people a little bit. Um, but um, there was one of these that was particularly special. And so I sent the following text to my friend, um, who's also a colleague, uh, which, you know. Uh, so the reason uh, that we, um, the, we found something that was really exciting, um, and that is this. This doesn't look like much. This is a fuzzy red dot. I'm well aware. The thing is, when you're pushing the boundaries of what your instruments can do, you're always gonna get fuzzy dots. I realize that's disappointing because you want nice pictures, but often when you get a picture of a fuzzy dot, it's the most exciting thing that you can get. It's even more exciting than the, the really nice pictures. Um, so this is different um, because what we found out when we did some the math and physics portion of astrophysics is that this is a galaxy that is too massive too early. This object shouldn't exist. This was the most exciting discovery of my scientific career. And the reason um, is the following. Uh, so this is a simulation of the formation of the universe. And what will maybe or maybe not become immediately obvious as you watch this is that little things form first, and then gradually, over billions and billions of years, bigger things form. And so you don't expect there to be really big things at really early times. That's simply not allowed in our current understanding of how things form. So when we found something that was really, really, really massive at really, really early times, that should not exist according to our models of cosmology. So um, I, uh, my friend Rachel and I uh, immediately, as soon as I found this, started fitting um, to figure out the physical properties of this. Uh, we sent the results to our colleague, uh, Evo, who was over in Europe at the time. So he was, um, it was daytime for him. So he worked during the day and found another, another five of these objects. Um, we got on Zoom all of us, and uh, had the paper submitted to Nature uh, three days later. Uh, so, and the reason is because uh, we knew this was a big deal. We knew that these objects uh, flew in the face of our understanding of the growth of structure in our universe. Um, so this, uh, oops, yeah. So we asked uh, the theorists what's going on, um, and they said, well, either you're wrong, most of them just said you're wrong, um, or we need to change um, our understanding of how galaxies form at early cosmic times. Um, so uh, because of the potential implications of this, uh, it got a lot of attention. Um, I got to... Uh, I got to talk to Lisa, who will be talking next, um, about, about this, uh, which, was, which was very fun. Um, and uh, I got to be on 60 Minutes, which was really cool. Um, and the thing that it, it taught me most was that 
we as humans are all really excited to learn new things about our universe. And we, we want to discover we want to understand where we live. Um, and so this was really, really exciting. Um, this, uh, this paper ended up um, being uh, very highly referenced in the news. I guess that's obvious. Um, and there, it turns out that there's these little red dots everywhere. They're all over. Um, and so the conclusion that we came to is that one of the following must be true or is likely true, and possibly there's something even weirder going on. So um, our models um, for understanding galaxies are very wrong. This is probably the most likely. Um, our cosmology of the universe is wrong. This is not that likely, but would be very cool if it was, because what's more fun than proving theorists wrong? Um, and uh, the third possibility is that these are not, in fact, galaxies that we're looking at that they're in fact huge supermassive black holes. Now, the reason that we think these things are very massive is because they're very bright. So you might be thinking, why would they be black holes? Black holes are black. In fact, they're not. Uh, they're some of the most luminous objects in the universe, and that is because they're converting um, the energy um, via gravity into light. Um, so these are some possibilities for what these things are. And fortunately, um, I'm the PI of a program that just got um, spectroscopy very recently um, of these objects. And uh, though it is not in a state for me to show you right now, it's ugly, um, uh, at least some of these objects are confirmed to be actually massive and actually at very early times. So we're not totally crazy, just maybe a little tiny bit crazy. Um, so uh, the, oops. Um, so this is my first summary slide, which is um, that there's cosmically chunky galaxies, just like these beautiful cats. Um, and the other conclusion that I will leave you with is that already just two years in to the opera to the operations of the James Webb Space Telescope, we are already making incredible discoveries that change our understanding of exoplanets, of galaxies, of the universe that we live in. Um, and it's really gonna be an exciting uh, time for us and for astrophysics and for you guys, the young people here, this thing is still gonna be working when you're done with college and you can make the next set of discoveries. And it really doesn't take being a genius to do astrophysics. It just takes hard work and dedication. And so, um, especially to you guys, um, I'd really encourage you to contribute to the next generation of science. Um, so thank you, everybody. Thank you, Erica, for sharing these exciting results. Um, so one, one of the things that um, stood out in the, the image that you showed, the first image that, that President Biden released, um, so there are these little fuzzy red dots that excited you, and there are these beautiful spiral galaxies that look like the Milky Way, but there are also these stretched out arcs, and I was wondering if you can tell us about what those are. Yeah, so the so you saw in that image these these arcs like Ida was talking about, and what those are is uh, they're due to gravitational lensing. So this is one of the more peculiar uh, predictions from uh, Albert Einstein um, in general relativity. You actually see that light gets bent around really massive objects, um, and so that's what those are. Those are. Uh, those are very distant galaxies that are getting gravitationally lensed by that huge foreground dark matter cluster. That's, that's amazing. Um, you mentioned um, uh, these supermassive black holes and the possibility that uh, maybe some of these very massive distant objects are actually uh, powered by, by these. And so do we have an understanding of how those could form at, at such distant, uh, you know? That's a great yeah. question, and it's it's interesting because you know although 
I'm really, I'm on the side of galaxies, not on the side of black holes, like I like galaxies better. Um, it still would, one of the reasons that we were so excited about these, these observations that we just got a couple weeks ago um, is that regardless of what is powering these objects, it's interesting. And in particular, like Ido was asking, we really don't, basically every galaxy in the universe, we think, has a supermassive black hole lurking at its core, which is a little creepy and weird and also true, and we don't really know how they got there. In particular, we don't know how supermassive black holes form at really early times. It takes a lot of stretching of the imagination to get a billion masses worth of sun into a black hole after a only a couple hundred million years of cosmic time. So if that ends up being what some of them are, it will allow us to understand the formation of the first supermassive black holes, which would also be very interesting. That's great. Um, we'll, we'll have time for more questions. I, I just wanted to ask one quick one, which is currently, what is the record holder for the most distant galaxy that we know about from, from James Webb? What is the redshift or when it formed? Well, actually, the person in charge of this is sitting in the front row. His name is Daniel Eisenstein. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Professor Eisenstein's program is addressing this right now, and it's uh, a couple hundred million years after the beginning of everything, which is incredibly surprising that you could organize the universe to form the atoms and stars enough to form a galaxy in a couple hundred million years. That sounds like a really long time, I realize that, but in cosmic terms, it's not. So it's really it's really cool, and I'm excited to see what comes out of Daniel's program. Okay, great. Thank you, Erica. Okay, and now it's my pleasure to invite um, Lisa Grossman to the podium. Right, excellent. Hi, thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to be here too. My name is Lisa Grossman, and I'm lucky enough to be able to say my job is astronomy reporter. I get to spend my days reading astronomy papers and talking to astronomers who are the best and writing up what I learn. Um, it is as much fun as it sounds. And I think seeing space through a news lens gives me a bit of a different perspective on the whole thing than the people who are actually doing the science. So today I'm going to give you a bit of a look backwards at how JWST has shown up in the news and how the way we talked about it changed from before launch to after launch. Um, scientists started planning for the next telescope that would succeed Hubble before Hubble even launched. This is a pamphlet from a meeting in 1989. Hubble launched in 1990. And the, they knew that they would need it to be big. They knew they would need infrared. And the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute at the time was worried that it would take 15 years-ish to get it off the ground, and so he wanted to get a head start on designing it. Um, one thing I think is cool, kind of as a side note, the design didn't actually change that much between then and now. This is a paper from 1998, and you can see some really familiar features here. We've got the sun shield, we've got the, pro the segmented primary mirror, and the secondary mirror off in a boom, and it's open to space, so it's passively cooling. Um, so that's really not all that different from what we ended up with, which I think is neat. Um, but so you can do the math. It took a little more than 15 years from concept to launch. And as Ido told us at the beginning, in the mid-90s, this telescope was supposed to cost a billion dollars-ish and launch in 2010. By 2010, it was clear that was not going to happen. So uh, Congress called for an independent review panel to investigate what was going on. And that panel found that the launch could not be any earlier than September 2015 and that it was gonna cost at least six and a half billion dollars at that point. And the astronomy community kind of freaked out. Some of them freaked out because they wanted to save their telescope. They, were, they did not want this telescope to get canceled because they wanted to do all the cool work that you are now doing. But some others freaked out because they were afraid saving this telescope would leave nothing left for the rest of the astronomy projects they wanted to do. Now we're getting into stories I worked on. This was my first byline in about JWST back in 2010. Um, I remember doing an interview for this story from the side of the road when I was driving to my parents' house for Thanksgiving. <laughs> and so the point of this story was that astronomers were seriously anxious that in order to pay for JWST, NASA was going to cannibalize the rest of the astrophysics budget. People were saying stuff like, JWST is eating everybody's lunch. 
Um, you know, scoop me on this one a bit, but here's that nature story calling it the telescope that ate astronomy, Billy Billings. That name was very sticky. It got referenced in future stories a lot. Um, but it was a big deal. Congress seriously threatened to cancel JWST altogether. In 2011, we had a flurry of stories with Save the James Webb Space Telescope in the headlines. These went space.com, another in The Guardian. Wired had two of these within a couple days of each other. I think one was opinion and one was news, but still. Um, but it was saved. They figured out how to do it, and they did not devour the rest of the astrophysics budget in order to do it. But it did keep missing its launch date. Here's a story from 2009 from Science News, which is the magazine I work at now. And this was a kind of look, a look forward at like, here are some telescopes that are coming up and they're going to be exciting. Back in 2009, we thought it was going to launch in 2013. And then that slipped to 2015. And then after the, uh, after Congress saved it, didn't, after it did not get canceled, that went to 2018. And then that slipped again, and a little bit more, and oops, there's a pandemic, maybe we'll launch now, no, not quite. Um, and it kind of became a running joke among, I think among astronomers, definitely among astronomy writers, that you could take the last paragraph of any story I wrote between 2010 and 2020 and just like scratch out the, you know, we'll learn more when JWST launches in mm, year plus five. And I found some memes on Twitter. <laughs> this is, is a, a little bit fuzzy, this is a Star Wars meme saying, I have altered the JWST launch date. Pray I do not alter it any further. Uh, and here's Charlie Brown and Peppermint Patty. Do all fairy tales begin with once upon a time? No, many of them begin when JWST launches. <laughs> um, but there was actually a small scientific silver lining to this. All those delays meant that before JWST launched, this little guy could launch. This is the transiting exoplanet survey satellite, which Caroline mentioned. And this little telescope was perfect for finding exactly the kinds of planets that JWST was going to observe and to look at their atmospheres. So when, and this one launched in 2018, so when JWST did finally launch in 2021, there was already a list of targets for it to go do exactly the kind of work that Caroline is doing. So she could get started right away and not have to wait for these planets to be discovered. Um, so that's nice. Maybe, you know, if JWST finds signs of life on one of those planets, we can credit the delays a little bit. <laughs> Um, so finally, it's 2021, the telescope's getting ready to launch, and right at the finish line, there was another controversy that came up in the news. In early 2021, some astronomers circulated a petition to change the telescope's name. James Webb, the person, was the director of NASA during the Apollo era from 60, I'm not going to remember the actual dates, in the 60s. Um, and in 2002, the NASA director then thought that James Webb was a good person to choose for the name of this next big telescope because he was instrumental in keeping science as part of the Apollo program when most of the rest of the world was focused on getting humans onto the moon and beating the USSR and so on. James Webb was like, but we should also do science, and that's very good. We wanted that. Um, but he was also a high-level U.S. government official during what's called the Lavender Scare, when gay and lesbian employees of government jobs were fired because of their sexuality. So this group of astronomers who wrote this um, op-ed, I guess, in Scientific American, you can see their names up there, I hope, um, they argued that NASA should not be arguing, uh, should not be honoring somebody who presided over something like that by letting this huge, important telescope bear his name. A lot of ink was spilled about this. Here's a piece in Slate by Matt Francis, who was one of the first people to blog about this issue back in 2015. Uh, another one in Nature, one in The Atlantic. Sunday New York Times had a splashy piece about it with this headline in 2022. And so NASA did an investigation, and they found no evidence that James Webb personally fired anybody for being gay. Um, they released a statement saying as much. They did not release the full report of their investigation at that time. And they didn't change the name. And so here's a story about that from NPR, from Nell Greenfield Boyce. And um, I'm going to call up my friend Alex Witze really quick. She did a great job covering this issue. Uh, she wrote about that initial announcement when it first came out. And she included the voices of the LGBT astronomers who wrote that petition. Then she did a public, relation, uh, public information request for NASA's emails through the Freedom of Information Act. She FOIA'd NASA's emails to see how they were talking about it internally. And then again in November 2022 when NASA, um, yeah, this one's my favorite, um, when NASA finally released that report, she said NASA really, really won't rename the Webb Telescope despite community pushback. So that's it for the name. Um, 
It is still called the James Webb Space Telescope, but you might notice some astronomers only refer to it as JWST, as a, as a small form of protest. Um, some people think that this is still a black mark on the telescope's reputation, like NASA's own present day LGBT employees were like, this bothers us, and NASA was like, oh well. Um, and some publications will say James Webb Space Telescope the first time we refer to it, but say JWST on future references instead of Webb, the way we talk about Hubble. Um, I think the whole thing kind of raises questions about whether we should be naming these giant projects after people at all. Um, people are complicated and the things that we think are acceptable change over time and maybe this is not a great idea. Maybe the Mars rover community has it right. We could pick an inspirational noun like perseverance or curiosity and it's hard to generate controversy over that. But anyway, okay, naming issues notwithstanding. Christmas Day 2021, we heard about this already. It finally launched, off it goes. Um, and as we've also heard, everything since then has gone incredibly well. Um, the launch was so perfect that they have enough fuel on board to last for 20 years instead of the nominal five years. The instruments are all working better than expected. Basically, everything has been going beautifully. Um, Joe Biden scooped NASA by releasing the first image the night before NASA had planned a press conference. Um, and so a year later, or within a year, we have headlines like this. James Webb Space Telescope transformed astronomy. It's mind-blowing and it transformed astronomy. I'm gonna grab a little bit of water, hold on a sec. Okay, this one's mine. The first pictures were stunning and they were dazzling and it restored some of this columnist's faith in humanity. <laughs> And the memes got better. Um, <laughs> so we all love it. Um, and it's like we forgot the whole near cancellation thing ever happened. Uh, I'm gonna take a little detour to talk about something, a little like behind the curtain science journalism issue that's been niggling at me a little bit. Uh, one thing that is really cool and unique to astronomy is the way that you have a first light moment. Not a lot of other scientific fields have a moment when like you had no data and now you have data. And Erica teed this up really nicely. So as soon as these, uh, the first data came out, as soon as those pictures were released, scientists started digging into it. This is a story I wrote uh, from 11 days after the first images were released about papers that showed up on the um, archive preprint server three days after the images were released. The work in the story was about weighing this galaxy cluster that's in the foreground that's distorting those galaxies in the back that get all, all cool, stretched, um, and also about searching for the most distant galaxies in this image that they could find, as Erica told us too. That's a big industry with JWST. Uh, but like, that's what the science was. What the story was was, oh my god, astronomers are so excited. And I was excited too. I wanted to write about this immediately. Um, and the thing with that rush is, the telescope was brand new and hadn't been fully calibrated yet. So some of the details, some of the actual numbers that they were coming up with turned out to be wrong. Not because of any like malfeasance or um, fraud, or it wasn't even really an error. It just is how it goes. It was just early excitement needing adjustment. But I have been wondering as journalists, how do we report on stuff like that? Stuff that is new and exciting, but also maybe not like fully baked yet. Um, Erica also teed this up fantastically. This is my story about El Erica's universe breakers. Um, and not all of them turned out to be galaxies, if I'm correct. One of them at least is a baby black hole. And since then a lot of other people have taken a look at this phenomenon, of, at this, um, this story. Erica also told us about all the other outlets that covered this story. Um, and it's, you know, we've had more headlines, more like that after the fact. So also, this is great, this is fine, this is how science works. I think having these um, scientists found a thing and then other scientists looked at it and found something else does represent how research is actually done. But I worry that people who aren't following this stuff as closely as I do don't see or remember that whole arc. They just see, here's a cool splashy result, or scientists were wrong. And I don't think this is like the biggest issue in the world. Nobody's making medical decisions based on what I write about JWST. But in this climate of like public trust in science sinking lower and lower and lower, um, 
I wonder if having this like tennis match of headlines contributes to that distrust. And, but I also think it's responsible to report both the initial results and the things that counter it later on. Um, I don't know, I think some people will disagree with me that this is even a problem. I will probably keep writing this kinds of stories. Even Erica was like, we've got new data. And I was like, oh, I want it. Let me, let me write about it, <laughs> even if it's not fully baked yet. Um, so I don't know what a better option is, but it is something that a few years ago I would have been like, any talking about astronomy is great, who cares? And now I'm a little bit waffly on it. So I welcome questions about that later if you have any ideas. Um, so OK, back to JWST. You've been hearing about how amazing it is all afternoon. Do you think it was worth waiting for, worth the, the delay and the expense? Yeah? Yay. <laughs> so, the, okay, so the thing is, something very similar happened with Hubble. Some of you might remember this. When Hubble launched in 1990, it was seven years late. It was almost canceled twice. It was triple its original budget when it finally did launch. And here's how we were talking about it then. It was a big disaster. Uh, one article in the New York Times compared it to the Tower of Babel. Astronomers may have felt that they too were the victims of a heavenly rebuke. Um, astronauts had to go up on the space shuttle to fix it. They effectively gave it glasses. Here's a color picture of that before and after. It looks much better. But that was in 1993. It was up there for three years, not taking the sharpest face photos, not living up to its promise, being a big embarrassing boondoggle for NASA. But 10 years later, we have Headlines like this one, we love Hubble. Of course we love Hubble. Um, another one from space.com in 2020, Hubble transformed our view of the universe. In 2021, Smithsonian called it an interstellar success. Um, and Hubble is practically synonymous with astronomy these days. It's the one telescope almost everyone can name. It's synonymous with awe and wonder. Nobody doubts its value. Um, so the parallels there, I find them interesting. and. It looks like history is repeating itself again over in planetary science. NASA has been planning to bring back bits of Mars to Earth for decades. The Perseverance rover has been caching little samples in little tubes and leaving them around Mars like breadcrumbs for a future rover to come and pick up. And many people think that this is the only way that we will actually be able to find out if Mars was inhabited. We have pretty good ideas that it was habitable, that it had much more hospitable conditions to life at one point, but the small, shrunk down versions of the labs that we can send on rovers, as amazing as they are, are not as good as what we have here on Earth, where we can have you know, huge rooms for it. So if we can get some of those pristine samples back here and look at them in our Earth labs, we can find out a lot more and answer some of like these really enormous questions that um, are not exactly the same, but are kind of analogous to the ones that JWST is looking at, like, are we alone and where did we come from? Um, but Stop me if this sounds familiar. The follow-up mission is running late, and it's over budget, and Congress doesn't want to give it more money, and people are losing jobs. Um, another one for space.com. The mission had an unrealistic budget from the first place. Scientific American quotes the science on the subhead here, calling it a dumpster fire. And there was a story in the LA Times just last week that made the same point that I'm making. The problems that the Mars sample return mission is facing now have big echoes of JWST in 2010. And I'm not up here with solutions, but I do think it's telling that every time this happens, every time this sort of thing has happened before, we've been glad that we stuck it out. There's a parable about an old farmer planting pear trees, and a traveler passes by his farm and says, what are you doing? It takes years for pear trees to produce fruit. You're not going to eat those pears. And the farmer says, yeah, I know, but there were pear trees when I got here, and I want to make sure the people who come after me have pear trees too. These long space missions take a long time. They don't fit in a single political term. Sometimes the people who started them don't get to see them finish. But space scientists keep planting saplings, and we all enjoy the fruits. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, for the perspective of, of a science writer. Um, I want to kind of ask a question about um, being a reporter on, on things related to astronomy more broadly. So there's this running joke among astrophysicists that um, when you're on a plane, if you want to quickly kill a conversation with your seatmate, you say you're a physicist. Uh, but if you want to strike up a conversation, then you say you're an astronomer, totally. and then you can talk for six hours. <laughs> um, 
So in, in your experience as a science reporter, what, what do you think that it is about astronomy that resonates with people? I think so that well. these beautiful photos really help a lot. I think that makes it um, more tangible for people. Um, and yeah, I think that, that having things that you can look at and you can really imagine rather than particles or forces or things that are a little bit more abstract, I think that's part of it. And I think that also everybody has a relationship with the sky. The sky is there for all of us. So there is a, a forgive me for the pun, universal um, connection between astronomy and every person who lives on this planet. And also there are the, the idea that there are other planets. We live on a planet. We know what a planet is. So it's, um, yeah, it's really approachable that way. Yeah. Um, you've discussed this kind of broader issue of, um, you know, this, this long trajectory of JWST, the threats of cancellation and so on, the, the you know, public support and support in the community. Um, so f as somebody who thinks about kind of the, the public reaction to, to big science projects, um, what do you think is the kind of most valuable lesson from the JWST story that the astronomy community can absorb as we think about the next generation or even, of potentially even more ambitious projects? That's a good question. I mean, I think we have really short memories for this. So one of the things is just don't forget how it went last time and don't forget how differently politicians who work on short timelines and get scared by big numbers view your projects than you do. Um, I don't really have any policy suggestions. That's not yeah. really my role, but... Yeah. yeah, because we are, we are planning big things. Yeah, for the and future. I hope you do yes. them. <laughs> I want to write about them. Yes. Great. Okay, so I'd like to um, invite the, uh, the other speakers to join us uh, at, at the panel and um, have some more conversation. So I want to thank all of you for, for really fabulous presentations and um, you know, showing us these beautiful images and spectra and, and making, making all of us think about uh, what amazing things are, are yet to come. Um, so there are some questions that I wanted to ask and, and we have questions from the audience and some of them are, um, I'm going to kind of ask uh, each one of you individually and some of them I, I would like to kind of hear your opinions on. Um, and I'd, I'd like to start with some questions that are more about the experience of working with data from something that's so cutting edge and, um, and has been so long in the making. And I think all of you have kind of touched on that, that aspect of it. Um, but if you can each tell us, and maybe we'll start with, with Sierra, um, what, what does it feel like if, to you know, have your career kind of perfectly timed uh, to, <laughs> in yeah. this long trajectory of you know, 20 or 30 years of, uh, in the making? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think Lisa like, pointed out that there was like this silver lining that the TESS um, telescope launched you know, in the delay that JWST had. And so there are fortuitous events in this delay. And so me personally, I'm very happy that <laughs> JWST was delayed because that means that I, I am very lucky and I'm very privileged that this is the moment that um, I get to work on these things. Um, so I really feel that it's a, it's a huge privilege. Um, it really is this feeling of, of being very grateful for the, the people who dreamed the dream that then worked all that work to make it happen. Um, so yeah, I feel very lucky. Caroline? Yeah, so I spent my whole like PhD and postdoc and early faculty time like running simulations that would tell us like what we'd be able to see with the James Webb Space Telescope. And in the end I was like, I was like, okay guys, like I've run a lot of simulations about what we're <laughs> gonna see. We actually really need to get the data to, to see what it looks like. Like I'm done just running, running simulations. So it's, it's been so exciting to transition into that new phase and see, you know, some things about our simulations were right and some, some were wrong. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a really fun couple years. Uh, for me, it's definitely been the highlight of my career, unquestionably. It was, my entire career was essentially spent in preparation 
for this telescope. And then once we started getting data and they were just spectacular, it's honestly like kind of hard to do anything else. Um, but it really was the, the hope of this data coming that w is, is the reason I'm here. There's some very hard times in, in, in all careers, but um, in academia as well. And it was the idea of being able to see that first data that is the reason I'm here. So it has just been a remarkable gift. Yeah, great. Um, I want to ask about um, the fact that, um, and we'll, we'll come back uh, in a few minutes to how time on the telescope is divided and how it gets to decided what programs get observed and what don't and so on. Uh, but one of the um, aspects of JWST data is that typically it has very short, especially in this first couple of years, very short or no proprietary access period. That means that data get collected and then they get, uh, they're open to, to everybody to use. Um, and so um, I, I wanted to kind of hear from you, what's, what's the experience of, you know, you get your data and you know that perhaps there are 50 other people around the world looking at those same images at the same time that you do, trying to do similar things. Um, what, what does that feel like and what, how do you think it affects the science? Erica, maybe you can start with you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's really, I think one of the, I think it, it cuts two ways. There's, uh, it's really cool because, you know, there is this sense of community, like we, as a community, built this really expensive instrument. Although I will note, it is like a factor of 10 less expensive than it costs to put on the World Cup. So like, consider what is more important for humanity. Um, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so that aspect is really cool, and I think you know the way we kind of decide what what we're going to fund as a community is very communal. We we decide you know together in these in these reports every ten years what our priorities are, and so in some ways having uh, you know having this data immediately public is really really cool. It allows us to absolutely get the most out of the science. On the other hand, um, it has been noted at a number of conferences I've been at so far on these early JWST data, um, it is, it's much worse for women, um, in particular people who have childcare responsibilities. Um, and so I think there is kind of two sides, but I, you know, it is really amazing that everyone kind of gets to participate immediately. And everyone, including everyone in this room, whether you're a trained astrophysicist or not, can get this data, you can download it, and you can look at it. It's, that aspect is really amazing. Caroline? Yeah, I think one thing that's interesting to me is the, the social side of this, right? That I think the, the extragalactic community and the exoplanet community actually worked really differently with their kind of big initial programs. And exoplanets somehow had a lot of community diligence to like, have everybody included in one big program together. And we were very accepting, like everybody can come and help. Let's all write papers together, which was a lot of work because it's just like a lot of voices to write a paper with hundreds of other people. But it did mean that we, we didn't have as much of the kind of back and forth of like some people found this result, and then it changed a little bit when we did a new calibration because we had because we had everybody on board, nobody was trying to like race against each other. And so I think that it's really interesting to see the differences there. Um, and I think that people still felt stressed to get the results out quickly to be able to, to kind of get the results out for the team. But I think there's a little bit less back and forth. And so I think that communities really have to figure out what they, like how they want to run as a, as a body of humans working on science, as well as trying to get science out as, as fast as we can. Yeah, I think these are all really great points. I think it's, it's definitely a, a double-edged sword having the data come, become public immediately. So I, I think there's definitely benefits to having some data come out immediately and having some of it have this proprietary period. I mean, you know, as an early career person, you know, a lot of the people on my team, and myself included, we weren't around for, for analyzing the Spitzer data. This was a new realm of astronomy for all of us, and it took us a while to get up to speed. 
we had to learn uh, the kind of data that we were working with and, and how to analyze it. And so we needed some of this time to, to work on the data without um, some of the experts in the field, you know, going ahead and, and you know, scooping all of the results. Yeah. So, so I think there's definitely a benefit to having um, both, both types of, of data, publicly available immediately and, and a proprietary period. So Lisa, a question for you kind of related to this. Um, there, there's so much science coming out of JWST so fast. Um, you know, multiple papers every single day. Um, these beautiful images that we've seen and many more. Lots of press releases and a lot of them are, you know, predicated on this, the first time we've seen this. So as a, as a science reporter, how do you decide what to, what to report on? You can't report on all of it. What, how do you decide on what's going to be of particular interest to the public? Great difficulty. Um, I mean, firsts are always good. We love firsts. Uh, or, or superlatives, the most distant, the biggest, the most energetic. Um, and pretty pictures are always helpful. Um, and another, oh, I had another thought. You know what, I'm losing it, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. It's okay, we'll come back to it. But uh, I'm taking notes here on the Great. superlatives <laughs> that we should use in our next press release. Um, Great, so, um, so we talked oh, about- sorry. Yeah, I know what no. I was gonna say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, guys. Um, so the, some, some journals have what's called an embargo period, so the like science and nature, some of you are nodding, you know this already. Um, so they will put out um, an email to accredited journalist, you have to like sign up for this and you have to be very responsible and prove how much of a accredited journalist you are in order to get on these email lists. And then you get the um, table of contents and, and a little bit of a blurb about some of the papers that are coming out that week a few days early. And that gives us a chance to um, do the reporting and you know, call up people like these guys and mm -hmm. say, okay, what is it that you did? And then um, and write something up so that I have it ready to go when the paper published. When, so there, you, know, you might notice a lot of space stories coming out at like 1 p.m. on a Wednesday or 2 p.m. on a Thursday. That's nature and science. Or not just space, actually, all science. Um, a lot of outlets will have their stories all come out at the same time when the embargo lifts. So that is one way to, you know, that, that's helpful in that somebody who has looked at everything that is coming into the journal has done a little bit of the pre-vetting and says like, okay, here's, here's what we think is the most interesting thing in our journal this week. That's a good sign that that is probably worth covering, um, but it also means it's not gonna be very unique because all my you know, colleagues at other magazines and other publications are getting those same emails. So sometimes I'm like, great, under, like I have the, whatever's coming out in science this week and I definitely wanna write about that. And sometimes I would rather find something myself that's a little bit more obscure, so that's part of it too. That's great. So we talked about, um, you know, there's JWST's observing all of these different sources that, that you've discussed. Uh, but of course, there are a lot, a lot of ideas about what JWST should do, and not all of them get executed. So I was wondering if one of you, maybe Erica, can tell us a little bit about <laughs> the, the process of, of how does this happen? Um, you know, how do these ideas get vetted, and how does it get decided what, what the telescope does? That's a great question. Um, happen to uh, have a lot of work on this this year. Um, so the, uh, so this year with, um, so everyone in the community um, has the opportunity to write a proposal for what they think that JWST should do. So if you're like, hey, I want to take a picture of Jupiter, you can write why we should take a picture of Jupiter and you submit your proposal. It's anonymous. So the people reading the proposals don't know who put them in. Um, and this year, um, when, uh, when we collated all of the proposals, uh, there was more proposals for uh, getting time on JWST this year than um, any telescope ever in the history of the world. So it was, uh, it was brutal out there. Uh, it, was, it was ugly. Um, it, you know, a very small fraction of those actually got time. Uh, and it's really hard to figure out what to give time to. I think, you know, we, we 
uh, generally assess these things by um, the impact within the subfield, uh, the uh, impact within astronomy as a field in general, um, and then also th we do take into account whether something could only be done by JWST, which is a very scarce resource. So that's how we that's how we prioritize, and then it's just uh, it's just brutal beyond that because we only select you know less than ten percent of the proposals. Any other thoughts from um, successful proposers for, <laughs> for using JWST? <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I mean, there's so many, so many proposals submitted, and, you know, it has to be good to be accepted, but there is a threshold, and above that, I, I think a lot of it is luck. Um, you have to be lucky in order to get these, um, these proposals through, because there's so much good science, great science that, that can be done and should be done, uh, and it's a scarce resource, so uh, there, there is definitely luck involved. Good, so um, let's dive into some questions um, about the specific science topics. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of questions coming in from, from the audience wanting to know some more details, so kind of go uh, back and forth. Um, so question for um, Sierra. So the um, question is how quickly do planets form, and what is the overall timeline between when that process starts that you described of, of a molecular cloud collapsing to form a star, and when you end up with this beautiful planetary system? Yeah, that's a great question. So the initial kind of collapse of the cloud is quick, in that it's like uh, uh, 100,000 years, maybe. That sort of time scale is quick. <laughs> it's very quick to us. Mm -hmm. Um, and then once you've formed that system and you have this disk, uh, it's a competition. So the planets have to form before the disk disappears. So there's lots of processes that, that make this disk disappear. Uh, the star is shining on the disk and blowing material away. Um, you can have nearby neighbors of these systems that are um, removing material from the outside in. And so you need to form all of your planets before the disk disappears. And in most cases, we see that disks disappear um, substantially within the first 10 million years of their, of their lifetimes. So you really have to form planets within those first 10 million years. And we think that actually planet formation um, must begin very early in order for that process to be complete by the time that the material disappears entirely. And then once that system is formed, then there's lots and lots of evolution by the time you get to the planets that, that Caroline's talking about. So it's also trying to piece together with the, the mature exoplanets, linking them back to their formation. There's a lot of time we have to account for uh, in trying to link those two. Yeah. And that's a perfect lead up to, to the next question I was going to ask uh, of, of Caroline. Um, so you showed that um, the planets that we have found so far around other stars um, look very different from the planets in our own solar system. We have these massive Jupiter-like planets with very short orbits. Um, and we haven't really found much that looks like our own solar system. So the question is, is this just um, because of the techniques we're using to look for planets, or do we think that our solar system really is in, in some way actually quite unique uh, in its configuration and quite rare? Yeah, so there's two ways to answer that question. So one is that the, uh, we are sensitive, we are more sensitive to find planets that are on shorter orbits that really don't look like our solar system. And so the reason we found all of those first is because we were sensitive to them and weren't sensitive to the planets in our own solar system. But now we can actually look at the statistics of the planets we found so far. And after running these surveys for long enough that we actually would have found Jupiter and Saturn, at least, in our own solar system, um, and potentially some of the inner planets if we were really, really lucky. Um, and so what we can tell from doing that is that it actually is a little bit unusual to have two gas giants like that, Jupiter and Saturn, that are both these massive gas giants in a system. And we can tell that actually the most common way to kind of configure your planetary systems is to have these planets that are between Earth and Neptune in size. We have no planets that size in our own solar system. We call them super-Earths and sub-Neptunes because we're really creative at naming these <laughs> objects. Um, 
And so those are some of the most common planets in the galaxy. So if you were going to look at a random star and guess what kind of planetary system is there, your better bet would be that it's one of these kind of little sub-Neptune systems rather than something that looks like the solar system. Um, Erica, a question for you. So um, you've, you've found these um, unexpected, um, you know, these fuzzy red dots that look like very massive uh, galaxies at early time. Uh, this is not what you were necessarily going out looking for, um, given how, how unexpected they are. Have you also found the galaxies that people have anticipated finding based on our previous knowledge from, from Hubble, for example? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the, the big things that we were, were looking for is, you know, to, to find the most distant objects in the universe. Um, and we didn't know what that answer was going to be. Um, but like Daniel's pointed out, we, you know, those are really figuring out when that frontier is, when the first moment in the universe at which galaxies could form um, is a really is really constraining to our models of of the formation um, of galaxies in the universe. Um, so we do see a lot of um, fuzzy blue dots, uh, which are the galaxies that we're expecting to see. It's a big difference. Fuzzy red and fuzzy blue, very different. Um, so uh, because those are uh, those are the kind of things we expect. We expect to see things that are low mass because they're young, the universe is young, and so we do see, we do see a lot of those objects. Um, Lisa, a question for you. So, um, as, as you're you know, writing about science, you're not just writing about astronomy, do you, do you find that, um, you know, do you ever find yourself wanting to kind of zoom in and work at a particular area and really focus on that? Uh, and delve deep kind of into that, that one area, for example, astronomy, and um, think not just about, um, you know, writing about, let's say, the, um, the, the latest discovery, but kind of the trajectory of how the field is evolving or what's happening and kind of on a broader scale. So I actually do write almost exclusively about astronomy in, mm -hmm. my, in my regular job. Um, my magazine, Science News, has, um, it's not unique in this, but it's, it's unusual that we have um, our reporters are subject matter experts, and we have really pretty narrow beats. There's the physics reporter, mm -hmm. and there's an earth sciences. We have, a couple, we have a couple of climate reporters. Climate is a really much bigger thing that not one person can cover. Um, so, yeah, I really actually do narrow it in to pretty much just astronomy most of most of my career. Um, so it's actually the opposite for me that I'm. Um, this year, I'm, I'm doing a fellowship at MIT where I'm expanding outside of astronomy. I'm studying biology for the first time since high school. So that's been fun. Um, within astronomy, I do sometimes go through periods where I'm obsessed with one thing. Like when the Kepler Space Telescope launched, every new exoplanet was a story for a little while there. Um, and uh, so yeah, um, I also don't just write news. I also write features, which gives you a longer word count and more space to look into like the history and the and the trajectory that things have gone on and the more meaty stories mm -hmm. you could tell. Okay. Um, question for um, Caroline. So um, in terms of uh, the divide between uh, small stars or, or brown dwarfs that you talked about and giant planets. Is there a clear division there or, or are these kind of just a continuum of the same types of objects? Yeah, great question. Love this question. So <laughs> we, uh, we have a, a line in mass that we've used historically. And that is 13 Jupiter masses, which sounds like a weirdly chosen number. Um, but it is, it is the value where when you have objects that are more massive than 13 Jupiter masses, they fuse deuterium, heavy hydrogen. Uh, they fuse it. And so the deuterium will, will all get fused. It like kind of adds a little energy to a time period uh, of, the, of the object. Uh, under 13 Jupiter masses, like actual Jupiter, you don't fuse the deuterium, so you can still see it there. If you go look at Jupiter, you can see there's deuterium there. Um, and so 
That's a historical line. A better line would be, okay, how did it form, right? Did it form around a star that had a disk around it and form like a, like a kind of scaled up version of the Jupiter formation process? Or did it form kind of direct collapse out of a cloud, right, like a star? forms. The problem is we can't take any given object that we look at and like rewind back in time and ask, how was it born? That's one of the things we'd like to figure out how to do, but we, we haven't really been able to do that yet. And so people use a variety of their own personal feelings about any given object based on everything they know about it to determine exactly what they call it, whether they call it a free-floating planet, a brown dwarf, they choose some different name, um, and so it's, it can be a little bit complicated. One of the really cool things that we're doing right now with James Webb is actually looking for deuterium using this, this feature in the infrared at 4.55 microns of CH3D. So it's like methane, but one of the hydrogens is swapped out for heavy hydrogen for deuterium. And so we're, we're trying to observe this now in different brown dwarfs that would actually let us tell what their mass is when otherwise it's really hard for us to measure their masses. So we'll at least have that information coming up soon. Fantastic. Um, so, Sierra, you mentioned that um, as, as you showed these very complex uh, spectra of, um, of these disks, uh, you mentioned that you can attribute some of these uh, complexes of lines to particular molecules. In fact, you're finding certain molecules in some of these systems that you didn't anticipate. You also alluded to features that are not identified yes. yet. And I was wondering, is, is this because we don't understand the chemistry of what's happening, or is it just a matter of time and doing laboratory experiments to kind of try to tease out what those molecules might be? Yeah, I think in the case that I, what I highlighted there of these disks around these very low mass stars, there's some of these features that we don't identify. And, and I do think in those cases where we have these clues from what is there, we can guess about what it is that we're missing. And so these disks have many, many hydrocarbons. So to me, it is not a stretch at all to say that these are other hydrocarbons. And we just haven't identified them yet. And so in that case, I think it's, it will be uh, a matter of taking our models, our predictions, and saying these are the other molecules that we would expect to be there. And then we just need the, the ground-based work in the laboratories, in the calculations, to determine what these molecules would look like at these wavelengths. And once we have that information, then we can go and map it up. So I think in some cases, we have a path forward. In mm -hmm. some cases, maybe you know, these things are, are really, we don't have an idea yet, and, and it'll just take time uh, to, to figure out what we're looking at. Yeah. Um, Erica, a question for you. So uh, you mentioned, you know, again, going back to these um, galaxies and, and the fact that um, you know, existing simulations or pre-existing simulations did not seem to uh, predict that we should have such massive galaxies at such early time. Uh, now that these results are out, um, have the simulations been adjusted? Has the theory been uh, kind of played with a little bit to see if there are ways to solve that problem? Yeah, there's been a couple, you know, a lot of simulators are fairly waiting until we have spectroscopy, which we just obtained until they throw their whole models in the trash. Um, <laughs> Which is basically them saying, like, we think you're wrong, um, which is fine. Um, that's part of the deal. Um, but uh, there has been a couple very interesting theory papers that I have uh, come across uh, on how we might solve this problem. One option, um, so basically, you know, galaxies are... Galaxies are the home. Gar galaxies are the largest gravitational building block of the universe. It's where all the planets, all the stars, all the black holes, everything lives inside galaxies. Um, and so you and you need to form these galaxies in these um, big cocoons of dark matter. And the properties of the dark matter in which these objects form uh, will drive how quickly the uh, the galaxies inside them are allowed to form. So, uh, one option, spicy, uh, is that some fraction of dark matter is not a particle. It's not, we think dark matter is a weakly interacting particle. Um, some, one of these theories uh, says that instead some fraction of dark matter is actually primordial black holes. 
So it's really tiny black holes. Uh, and that would allow things to collapse more quickly. Another option would be that these things form so, so fast um, that the normal mechanisms that regulate the growth of, um, of galaxies, these gravitational building blocks, um, are, don't even have enough time to take place. And so you have these different kind of scales of solution. You could, um, you could mess with uh, dark energy, you could mess with dark matter, or you can mess with the physics of the normal matter that we kind of understand. Those are the kind of three buckets you have, um, theoretically. Um, a question here about um, the distance of the objects that uh, you're all looking at. So Erica, you mentioned uh, some, some uh, astounding numbers, but I'm wondering, uh, Sierra, Caroline, can you tell us about how far away are these objects that you're looking at and, and in relation to some of these very distant galaxies, for example? Yeah, the closest planet that we're looking at, or the closest star, is Epsilon Indy, the one I showed, which is 11 light years away. That's by far the closest that, that I showed and that I've worked on. I think the furthest away are, are less than about 100 light years. So these are all, well, like, that sounds like a long way, right? Like a light year is the amount of uh, distance that light, which goes really fast, can travel in a whole year. But that's actually very, very close by um, in, our, in our galaxy. So really for exoplanets, we're looking at our, what we think of as kind of our neighborhood in the galaxy within the Milky Way. Yeah, for disks, it's it's on similar scales. They're they're slightly farther out than than most of these exoplanets that, that we're we're talking about. Um, they're on the scales of around a thousand light years away, so still very local. Um, one interesting thing is we have this very sensitive telescope, and so we can go beyond local, and we can go to more uh, extreme environments in different areas um, of the galaxy to to see how things are different. Uh, and so that's work that's that's ongoing. Yeah. And that, I think, raises an, an important point. Um, Erica, as you mentioned, we, you know, we don't see galaxies evolve in real time because things take too long. Um, uh, even, even the very fast process of planet formation is still you know, 100,000 years or a million years. We're not going to sit around and watch that happening. And so kind of a question for, for all of you. How do, you um, how do we piece together you know, by looking at different processes at different stages in different environment, how do you hope to kind of, that what you're seeing is representative of the broader scale of the universe? We need lots of time. We need lots <laughs> of time to look at, at many different objects with all of these different properties. If we have large enough samples, we can control for, for one thing, like age. We can keep some something constant and look at how, um, objects with different properties, keeping age the same, how they differ. Once you solve for that, you can start to um, solve some of these other connected properties of these systems. So really, I think it's, it's a lot in the statistics of, of the samples that you look at. Yeah, that's definitely true. One of the things that we're trying to do now, so most of the exoplanet studies are done around stars that uh, have planets that are right around the same age as the Earth, plus or minus a couple billion years, right? They're, they're mm -hmm. kind of mature planetary systems. But one of the cool things that we're doing now, we actually know of planets now, having discovered them with missions like TESS, um, planets around younger stars. And so we're trying to actually use the same techniques that I showed, but go kind of back to look at the, the baby planets and the, I don't know, toddler planets and adolescent planets and kind of connect it up to our, our mature planets that we're looking at. And we, we, in fact, you know, we just have a couple of these observations done so far because we just have a couple years of data. But what we're seeing so far is that for some populations of planets, their atmospheres definitely look different in various different ways at young ages than they do at mature ages. So this field is really evolving quickly right now. For us, we basically, you know, we we try to take snapshots of of galaxies at all of these different epochs 
Um, and so, and then it's kind of like a, you know, a photo album of you, right? You have your baby pictures and your toddler pictures and your kindergarten, your first day of kindergarten, um, and uh, all the way up until, you know, death. Um, but the, uh, <laughs> sorry, um, couldn't resist. Uh, but the, the, the thing that made, you know, the galaxies that we were looking at really surprising was, you know, it was like you're going to check on your toddler, and you walk in the room and it's a fully grown adult. <laughs> it raises some questions <laughs> about how that happened. Um, but so we, we basically are trying to take snapshots of objects and just piece together their evolution. But it, you know, it does require a lot of math. Um, so, you know, we, we've talked about the process and the fact that many ideas um, and many proposals to use JWST uh, do not get allocated time. You've talked about results from very successful programs. Um, I was wondering if you're willing to share uh, maybe an idea you had that, you know, did not resonate <laughs> with the time allocation process and where you wish that um, they just did their job and uh, <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, so uh, I'll just I'll just jump in there for failed proposals. <laughs> so uh, we have this set of proposals that we've put in that are to look for exo moons in various ways, and so that like it would be super exciting, right? So an exo moon, right, is a moon around an exoplanet. It would be so cool to find one of these, and we have various ideas of how we would do it, either looking for like a little transit in front or some other way, and. Uh, they, they just, you know, they're high risk proposals and they just don't resonate with the, you know, the allocation group in this, this time when it's, um, it's so oversubscribed, right? People really want to be putting their eggs, right, as the, you know, committee of people of us, right? A lot of us have served on these panels. You really want proposals that are definitely going to lead to science, and so you don't necessarily pick things that would be high risk, but also potentially high reward. I didn't know that was your proposal. It was really good. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to say ExoMoon stories resonate with readers really, really well, if that helps for next time. Um, I've written a bunch of stories about the search for exomoons. They always do really well. Yeah. Sierra, any anything? Yeah, you want to say? yeah. I mean, every you know, if you're in, if you're in this line of work, you're writing proposals that don't go through. It's just a, you know a numbers game. Uh, yeah, I, I tried to look for look at disks around things that are, are closer to planets. So I think you know in that in that source in that target, I think it wasn't uh, it maybe didn't resonate enough. And there, I think. There's potential then. If we bring the exoplanet community together with the disk community, which we should do more than I think we do, um, I think then we can, we can motivate these things more and then we can be successful in the future. Yeah. yeah. Erica, all successes or any? <laughs> I've had pretty good luck. Um, but the, uh, there's the, the one I put in this time, I was really excited about, it was called Dark Horse. And it was filled with horse puns, and it was really awesome and funny, and we had a great logo, and it didn't go through, and I was very sad about that. Mm -hmm. It was like literally the one right below the line. So, you know, these things happen. But it would have been far and away the most efficient way to do spectroscopic observations with the telescope. It would have like made it a factor of 10 to 50 more, more efficient, which is a big improvement. To my colleagues, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Lisa, a question for you. So you, you know, you, um, you're reporting on the science, on the exciting results that are coming out. Uh, at the same time, well, you know, I think one of the things that have been fascinating to me to hear from our speakers using JWSTs is the kind of the personal aspect of what it's like to work with the data, what it's like to be an astronomer using uh, this. What what is the kind of trajectory that you take and uh, you know proposals that get rejected along the way and the ones that succeed. Um, do you feel that this is something that's important to report about in addition to the science itself, about, about the, the humans behind the story? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I think science is a human endeavor, and the more we can humanize scientists, the more people, I, this gets back to the trust thing, the more people think that you are actual people, the more they trust what you do. Um, and the more relatable it is, because this can seem really ivory tower and far off, especially for astronomy. So, you know, there's, we were talking before about how 
everyone has a personal connection to the sky, but not everyone has a personal connection to physics. And I think, you know, you, you astronomers are like so smart and I'm not that smart. Um, and not that you're not so smart, you are so smart, but I think our, I mean, my readers are smart too. And um, humanizing, reminding them that you're people and making the whole thing seem like a human thing to do is just, it's just true, it's just accurate. And, and it tells a good story. Um, people get interested in this stuff through stories more than through data. Sorry. <laughs> well, I think this is a very uh, good point to stop on. Um, and um, um, I'd like to conclude today's program. I, I really want to sincerely thank uh, Sierra Grant, Caroline Morley, Erica Nelson, and Lisa Grossman for your excellent presentations, for sharing your thoughts and your excitement uh, about your work. Um, and, and for this conversation and answering the, the audience uh, Q&A. I think one thing that, that came across that's very important to keep in mind is we talked so much about how complex uh, JWST is and how expensive and how long it's been in the making. Um, this is, uh, you know, science that's funded by the public um, and it's, um, you know, funded by the taxpayers. Many of them are sitting here in the audience. <laughs> Um, and so I think really this is a resource for, for us all and, and I hope that people really look at it that way and think about it that way and thank you for your support of astronomy research um, and that enables this growing understanding of the universe. Um, our program today was, uh, has been recorded and it will be posted on the Radcliffe website in about a week. Uh, we hope that you'll join us for future Radcliffe events in the sciences. Um, and more information on, on upcoming events can be found at the Radcliffe website at radcliffe.harvard.edu. Thank you again for joining us today and take care.